Welcome back to the garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. This has been a series of tour videos covering almost every plant that's in the garden here in Raleigh. This is a project that's been going on about three years. There's a playlist on the channel called New House. You can go back and look at all the videos from the beginning of the project. The house in the background is about to get a major facelift in the next few weeks. So by the time you guys see another tour video, Sometime later, we'll skip some time. We'll let some time go by, let some annuals fill in, and then show it, show the garden off again a little later in the summer. Hopefully, the house will be up, um, completely updated as well at that time uh, to go along with the garden. Of course, me, I'm going to move into a house and do the garden for three years, and then do the house. <laughs> and that's that's just me. That's just who I am. Uh, this uh, butterfly bush on the corner here. This is a butterfly towers butterfly bush. It's an upright, narrow growing cultivar. It'll end up about this tall before the season's over, but it stays super, super narrow. It just blooms like crazy. This is its third year out here along the street, and it's in, you know, it's in a very, very narrow spot between the curb and the fence, and, you know, uh, not the best of soil, but it just, it thrives out here and blooms and blooms and blooms. It'll continue to get a little size on it as time goes on. This is a um, Cheyenne Spirit Coneflower. These were the seed that we originally did for these. They've since uh, seeded themselves a little more in here. We'll have to, we're gonna come up to come in here and pull a few of them out eventually because we have a couple other things growing in here. But I want you to notice, and I've said this in a couple of the other videos, look how tall and vigorous these cone flowers are out here by the road versus other ones that are in the garden in other places. This soil is just completely unamended. Uh, it's got some mulch around it. We keep the weeds away from them, but other than that, there ain't, there's getting no help from us whatsoever. If we water, we'll water out here in the middle somewhere and about eight drops of it gets on that, uh, <laughs> gets into that spot. It just doesn't make it past the fence or anywhere. We never come out here and water. Uh, so these are really, really abused and they're really, really thriving. We have gold finches on them basically every afternoon. Of course, the bees, uh, the bees are out here for the nectar. And then, um, you know, after, after the seed set, we get the, uh, we get the goldfinches on them. One of the, uh, this is the fourth, um, this, is, <laughs> this is why we have to take a couple of these out because <laughs> they're really crowding the space in there. Uh, this is the fourth of the uh, boxwoods that are in the, uh, this Better Boxwood series that I'll be talking about a little more about later in the year. There's four different, there's four different varieties of those boxwoods that are blight resistant, um, which is pretty exciting. Our agave out here at the road is doing great. That December freeze really did set it back big time. It looked, uh, it lost several of the older leaves on it and I, I didn't know whether, you know, how it was going to come out, but it's grown a lot here in the last few weeks as it's gotten hotter. I expect to get quite a bit of growth on it uh, during the uh, growing season this year. There's a penstemon back behind it called Riding Hood Purple. Uh, and uh, it's leaned over a bit. It's newly planted. Uh, it'll get some size on it later in the season just for some purple color. Verbena bonariensis, there was one on the other side as well. This one actually just seeded itself here. These, so you get a few seedlings on these every year. You can decide to keep them or not keep them. This one will eventually take out. It's fine right now, but it won't, it won't be there forever. Uh, Agastache called uh, Little Adder, uh, nice little dwarf one. And that's as tall, pretty much as tall as that one gets. And Lots of vinca out here in the garden. There's still a couple pansies uh, doing okay here considering, you know, uh, it, has, it just hasn't been that hot. And even this coming week, we're supposed to get some thunderstorms and temperatures in the low 80s, really strange temperatures here. This little pine is called green penguin and you can kind of see it's got that little penguin shape to it. It's put on a lot of growth here recently. Uh, not, well, I mean, I, when I say a lot of growth, I mean a lot of growth for a very slow growing dwarf conifer, uh, uh, but I can see it's flushed out quite a bit here recently. It grows about this much a year uh, since we put it in. I mean, it's maybe been there close to two years at this point. Perfect little, perfect little entryway pine uh, here at the uh, entryway into the, uh, um, into the garden. We've planted lots of ground covers all over the garden. If you've watched this whole series of videos at this point, you know that there are a lot of them out here in total. Here's another sedum. Uh, this one is fairly aggressive. Some of the sedums are slow growing and uh, some of them are much quicker. We like to use them to cool the roots on some of these plants. This pine is actually out here. It's very hot in our area for this little pine. 
and uh, that little sedum growing around the base of it's keeping those roots cool. We will be careful not to let it grow up on it or anything like that, but keeping those roots cool is probably part of the reason this thing has grown like it has, but this thing's probably getting 10, 12 hours of direct sun, uh, and uh, here in the south, the sedum's helping out with that. Uh, this is a little native uh, aster. Uh, the variety's called Snow Flurry. It's just been planted this spring. Uh, it'll have white flowers later in the season. Uh, clematis on this corner, I think we have, there's three clematis out here now. This is Henry Eye. Henry Eye gets very, very large white flowers on it in the, in the future. And this one just kind of keeps blooming. Uh, that's the nice thing about it. I've got a neighbors who I admired for a couple years, just cause every time you walk by it from spring until fall, it has at least one or two flowers on it. The flowers are still, this is, believe it or not, this is actually a small flower. Uh, my neighbor's plant has them. They're probably almost twice as wide as that flower on a more mature plant. So I expect as the seasons go on, we'll get larger flowers on it. Another Liatris uh, spicata. We have a lot of these in the garden. They're just such great pollinator plants. Unfortunately, great for feeding the rabbits as well. But um, there was a white one in the last video. And this is kind of a, a lavender, lavender purple one. The plant directly behind it that's about to start showing some color is a hydrangea, uh, a hydrangea paniculata called Moon Dance. Extremely compact habit, extremely upright, sturdy stems. Uh, this and White Wedding are the two main flowering paniculatas we have. We have a couple more as well, but um, these two are probably the best. And they're just such a rigid, upright plant. It rained here. Uh, for the last couple hours. We took a break from filming, came back out, and look how upright it is. Almost any other paniculata gets any kind of moisture on it whatsoever. It starts to flop over, and this one's just rigidly upright. We showed off skyscraper pink salvia in the back garden. This is skyscraper orange, and it does have an orange, very orangey red flower on it, and an interesting calyx. The, the oldest calyxes are kind of green. The newer ones have kind of a, a pink, a uh, burgundy pink color. And then the flower itself is kind of a, almost a, you know, I guess they call this orange, but it's kind of a, a hot pink, honestly, uh, flower on it. And then it fades to a lighter pink. It's got all kinds of things going on with that plant. Pollinators absolutely love it. There's a, uh, a bumblebee on that side. I can't tell if it's a bumblebee or a honeybee. I can't see it from here. Lots of bees on that one all day long. Annual plantings out here. Some of this was done from seed. We purchased a few other things in four packs and six packs. We don't go for the many of the high dollar uh, annuals. The only thing I will buy that's an annual in a larger container has to be something that's going to get some size on it. So as an example of that, we've got an African basil over there. We'll show you in just a minute. Uh, or that something like a salvia that's not quite hardy here, but it's gonna get this big during the season. I feel like I can get value out of spending a few extra dollars. Everything else in here was bought in either a four six pack or done from seed in the house. There's dwarf zinnias in here, celosia, uh, coleus, uh, toothache plants, which are super, super interesting. Uh, the little yellow, uh, little yellow pods there. There's some melon, melon podium back here and some salvia as well, all blended into that, into that space. It looks really good. Uh, it's taken a little while for them to get going this season just because it's been cooler than normal. But at, at this point, they're really starting to take off. Some marigolds as well. Marigolds get slowed down by the rabbits. The rabbits just love to eat them. Um, so, and then we have our bees back here, which we haven't shown off on the channel at all at this point. Uh, we'll talk more about them later. Not an expert in bees. I'm relying on some other people to help me out, just kind of learning uh, this year. Uh, but uh, they're quite happy uh, at this point, and uh, we're enjoying them out here in the garden. We have a couple of Gerbera daisies out here in the front garden. Uh, very reliable coming back. That just super, super showy. They bloom and bloom. I've also found that these, if you tuck them up around something where they have the roots uh, kind of shaded on them, they seem to be uh, more vigorous. Uh, they need the sun on the tops and kind of shaded on the bottom. Seems to be the right formula for those. And they will just bloom like this the rest of the season. It's amazing how far plant breeding has come with uh, Gerbera daisies. I mean, they're just now, now they're just, to me, just great, great plants for the garden um, with that much color all season long. Just behind them, there are three radiant sabilia. 
variegated abelia back there. They've started blooming, but you can't really tell it all that much because the flowers kind of blend in with that variegated foliage. This little spiky growth up here on top, we'll go through and prune out here in the next few days and uh, get them uh, lowered back down again. Uh, really great plants across there. Great for those uh, native and non-native bees. Evergreen, variegated, low mounding, um, hard to miss, extremely drought tolerant, not something would ever need any additional water from us here in our area where we get regular rainfall. They do end up with a little bit of water on them because we'll water a couple things around them, but uh, they would never need it on their own. I love showing off this native blueberry. This is Rose's Blush. A beautiful pink new foliage, settles into blue, little lanceolate leaves. Uh, bloomed earlier in the season. Now it's forming these blueberries, which of course are edible, but we'll just let the birds have these. Great plant, uh, just blends in great with other things. Uh, any tour we have out here, any folks visiting the garden, this is, every, this is a definite question we get from everybody who visits and sees this thing. It's just so interesting, native to the Southeast United States. It's next to Acamia cyparis. Uh, obtusa called Nightlight. This is a Southern Living Plant Collection one. Look how great that plant looks. It's out here in the full sun. Doesn't really do any bleaching up here on the top. A lot of these uh, gold conifers will bleach out on the top. And if you've ever seen it happen, you'll know what I mean. It just literally turns white almost on the top. This one holds its, holds its form beautifully. We've got some annuals, uh, some z uh, zinnias and some salvia up against it down at the bottom. We'll go through and cut out around this a bit and make sure that we don't keep things up against it because it will brown out that foliage down at the bottom. And then the, and then the annuals will be gone and it'll just be brown. So we'll, we'll be careful to keep that cut out. But this is such, such, such a great plant. The, I'll go swing around here behind it. This is a crinum lily called Candy Stripe. Uh, it's already had one bloom stock, actually two. Uh, and they just flopped over in the garden and a third one has appeared. It's just tucked in under here. It's just a big, giant, bulbous thing under the ground. Uh, that anchor themselves in really, really well. The older they are, the more flower spikes you'll get on them. Probably get a little bit taller in the future as well. Incredibly showy, showy flowers. Um, just, a just a great plant. And again, we have the, the foliage part of it is kind of tucked up in the bed and the flowers come out and visit. Back here behind here, we have five Leanne Clara. We just wanted something evergreen in the center of this bed. A lot of the other things are changing all the time. A lot of annuals, a lot of perennials. And we wanted something that would just kind of settle the eye back here, just be green. These flush out with a burgundy color. So some part of the year they have burgundy on top of their green. Five is too many. We're gonna come in here and take out uh, one or two at some point and figure out, a, figure out a different arrangement for them. This is actually a great screening plant, really great screening plants. Another Southern Living Plant Collection piece incredibly clean, easy plant that I'm keeping two and a half feet tall that can be allowed to get eight or 10 feet tall and uh, make a perfect screening plant. Another Camia cypress, obtusa. This is Nana gracilis, kind of an upright, narrow growing uh, Camia cypress. So for, super soft to the touch. We have many of these in the garden and they, every one are just wildly different than the other. But this is, you know, the, the dwarf Hinoki cypress. Uh, this is the most, this is the look of most uh, the Cami Cypress uh, in the wild. Uh, and then, you know, we've done things like the gold nightlight one next to it and other forms that we have here in the garden. Tons of dwarf zinnias. There's dwarf zinnias in front of it. Uh, and a lot of those were done from seed here at the house. Then we have our giant zinnias. And we'll flip around here to the driveway side and show you lots of them. All right, so here is the uh, collection of giant zinnias so far. Not all of them have opened a flower yet. Again, we've seen a big delay on lots of things out here, but there's various oranges, yellows, uh, lavenders, uh, all opening slowly but surely. All of these were done from seed in the house earlier in the season and uh, really starting to look great. We interplant them with land, a perennial lantana that comes back every year. That particular lantana is called um, Chapel Hill. Miss Huff, uh, it's a little bit different than, or Chapel Hill, is it pink? Uh, I can't remember, Chapel Hill Miss Huff. I'll put it on the screen. Uh, there's Miss Huff Lantana that has a slightly different coloration, has a little more orange in it, where this one has a little more of that lavender color. Just as reliable as Miss Huff we have found. 
if you can find this one, striking color, and it matches great with all of these various uh, zinnias that are opening around it. At some point later in the summer, typically our giant zinnias like this will get a little mildew. They'll start to slow down some. We'll just pull them out, and by that time, this lantana will be gigantic, and it really works quite well together. Up above that, we have our native Ambalankia. Uh, this is Autumn Brilliance. Uh, it bloomed already this season, and then uh, it gets uh, uh, blueberry-like fruit on it. Uh, it hasn't flowered all that much for me uh, at this point. It's got, it actually just had a few flowers on it last week. The birds will typically get the berries before we do, but if you do get them, uh, they're quite tasty. Beautiful fall color on Autumn Brilliance. That's why it has the name Autumn, Autumn Brilliance. This one needs a bit of more pruning on it. It's too heavy on the top and uh, too small of a caliper down below. I did some pruning on it last year. I'm gonna have to do the same thing sometime this summer. I'll show it on the channel when I do the pruning on it. This is an Austrian pine. This one's kind of interesting. The variety is called Oregon Green. Uh, beautiful little conifer. Uh, will grow fairly slowly for us here in the garden in Raleigh, uh, but we did have these in uh, video up in Jay Sifford's beautiful garden up in West Jefferson, and his are already eight or nine feet tall because he bought very large ones. So this plant will get way bigger than this corner can support, but it's another one of those conifers we put out here. We're gonna enjoy it for five or six years. We'll probably do a little pruning on it at some point to keep it even a little bit longer. And once it gets too big, we'll take it out, put it in a container, put it in a different spot in the garden, or uh, gift it to someone who has a little more space for it. This is a little juniper called Golden Joy. Just a small weeping habit. We had it in a different spot in the garden. It was getting kind of lost where it was. We figured this spot along the edge of the driveway would be a good spot for it. It can just fall down the driveway, you know, fall down the edge of this little, this is actually a fairly steep slope. You can't really tell maybe on video, but this bed uh, is about two feet higher than the driveway ultimately. Uh, from, where I'm from where I'm standing here up to here is about two feet, about a two foot climb. So that juniper should just come right down onto the driveway in time. There's three of our native uh, clethra here. Uh, there are two ruby spice clethra, and this was meant to be the same, all three the same variety. It's worked out well, actually. The back two are ruby spice, which are pink uh, and very heavy, heavy, very heavy flowering varieties, but has a very upright kind of narrow habit. And that was kind of the point of having them here is we could get, put a little height here but it wouldn't spill over here too much. Uh, they'll start blooming pretty soon. In fact, they're budded up now. Get crazy pollinators on these things, like things you've never seen before. Little, all kinds of little flying uh, things will come to these when they're blooming. I absolutely love when, those, um, uh, when the clethra are blooming, you know, the fra fragrant flowers as well. The white one here is called hummingbird. Again, it's about to start flowering now. It's, it's budded up down lower in the plant, it'll bud up you know, throughout the plant over the next couple of weeks. It'll be in full bloom, probably by uh, the first to mid-July, something like that, typically on Clethra. I love having these in the garden because, you know, so many of our shrubs bloom in the early spring or middle spring and they're winding down. So some of these summer flowering shrubs, the hydrangea paniculatas, the caryopteris that was in the last video is a later blooming shrub. The clethra is a later blooming shrub. It's kind of nice to have some things that hold off a bit and give you some color later in the summer. A few more liatris over here. You think we're a little liatris crazy, but they're such great pollinator plants. Uh, unfortunately, again, rabbits do, rabbits do eat them down there. We have a sky pencil holly here, a new, an improved or a newer sky, sky pencil holly that's coming. Not a lot of availability on this one yet, but it's called Red Sky. When it's actively growing, it's burgundy red. Uh, there'll be a video on this in the fall with Dr. Reuter from down at UGA, who is introducing that plant through the Southern Living Plant Collection. It's not, it's not growing right now. We, put, we, just, we just have planted it. As Soon as it gets some roots under it and starts growing, it's just a really cool burgundy red new growth on it. And of course it has that upright narrow habit couple oriental lilies uh, out here. A couple of them got stepped on uh, in the process of doing some other things out here recently. Uh, melon podium uh, seeds itself like crazy, so just be aware. It is a great annual. Uh, there'll be tons of yellow flowers on these later in the summer, but we have to just kind of selectively leave a few that come up from seed. But there are a lot of seedlings every year, so just be careful with melon podium. Make sure you actually like it before you ever, ever use it. Uh, another Thuja, 
uh, right there called Fire Chief. Fire Chief is a great plant. It just, it does all kinds of cool things throughout the summer. Anytime it's growing, it has that kind of a pinkish hue to it. Toward the fall, it'll become, you know, just a, uh, a reddish orange color through the winter time. Um, it has lime green hues to it certain times of the year. Uh, really just always evolving uh, out in the garden, also very soft to the touch. Back just behind it is one of our native calicarpas. Buddy Lee gave me this one uh, down in Louisiana uh, a couple years ago. Starting to flower now, it flowers along the stems on the older part of the growth. And then uh, slowly but surely, uh, it'll continue to grow for another couple months. It'll end up a couple feet taller than it is now. The flowers come up the stems as they grow, then berries form in the older parts of the plants and the berries mature up the stems. And then they, on this one, this is a white berrying form. The berries stay on them right through the fall. You think the birds are never gonna take them. And then at some point the berries mature enough uh, to the point where the, the birds finally take them. And when they take them, it's like a all at once. They can't get them out of there fast enough. It's kind of fun to watch when they just kind of go wild on them. There is an African basil back here. This is an, uh, African basil is interesting. You can't, basil is super easy to do from seed. Uh, this one does not produce. This is a sterile variety, so it only can be bought as a plant. We usually, we bought three plants for a couple years, but that little basil right there will end up this tall and this wide. So if you have three of them, keep in mind, they're gonna cover a gigantic space. But by midsummer, that'll be the most popular plant in the garden for the pollinators, no question about it. That's number one on their, on their list. They're on it all day long. I don't know how it even produces that much nectar. I mean, it's literally covered in bees. And last clematis uh, to show off, this is Dr. Rupel, if you've been following the channel for any length of time. This one has the craziest uh, beautiful flowers on it. It's actually, oop, it's got one more. It's gonna come right here. Uh, it's finally gotten up to the top of the fence. It can take you, when you, when you plant clematis, a couple things to know. One is they like to they like the top of the plant to be in the sun, but they need their roots down in the shade. So we planted all of our clematis along the base of this fence so that the roots would be shaded and the tops could grow up into the sun. That's perfect uh, conditions uh, for any clematis. And then it will take a couple years for them to really get their feet under them. And then they just go wild. We'll wrap this up with a few things on the other side of the driveway. This has kind of been our at times a dumping ground and a place where we just put stuff that we don't know where we're gonna put until later. So it's not all that much order to it, but there are actually some very nice things in it. Uh, may need a little bit of rearranging in the future, but, uh, and it tends to be one of the last places that we'd ever think about watering uh, as well. So they've also taken a little bit of abuse. Uh, this is a Buckeye that we got from uh, Ram and Tom's beautiful garden down in Athens, Georgia. Uh, this is a red one. We have a white one a little further up uh, back that direction. We have several Asclepias in the garden. This is uh, one we started from seed. Uh, we've got Syriaca, uh, Tuberosa, uh, I can't remember what else, but we have lots of different Asclepias here in the garden for, you know, for pollinators and for uh, the, uh, uh, the butterflies later in the season. Just cut back the Philadelphus. This is Pearls of Perfume. It is a uh, mock orange that will just continue to bloom. So once this thing flushes back out, we'll just get more buds on it. It'll bloom again. It has double white fragrant flowers. This is a Solidago called Fireworks. Uh, love this plant. It's one of the show. It's probably one of the most showy Solidagos uh, there is. You know, these are uh, native from Canada down to Mexico. Just tons of different species of these, and some of them bloom in the spring, some of them bloom in the summer. But the vast majority of them get about this tall and bloom late summer into early fall. Uh, it's typically when they're uh, in full bloom, and they're great for pollinators because it's the time of the year when there's just less less things available, right? Uh, this is a pineapple guava, and you can see flowers on the back of it here. I don't know if stuff can get around here and take a look at these really, really beautiful flowers this gets. This is one of the plants I would have really thought would have been very badly hurt in that December freeze, but it managed, uh, uh, managed to be just fine. This is a fun one. This is a daylily called Autumn Minar Minaret. Not a daylily fan. Steph's not a daylily fan. I'm not a daylily fan, but we wanted this one because, you know, it's got this first flower spike on it, tiny little plant back here. This thing will get this tall when it blooms uh, in the future. And so just a super, super interesting uh, daylily. Uh, 
that will really stand out in the garden. It's different than other different than other daylilies. Rabbits eating marigolds. That's like a favorite pastime. That's what the garden should be called, rabbits eating marigolds. Here's one though that escaped them <laughs> and is looking pretty good. But we do all those marigolds from seed and then the uh, and then the uh, rabbits just have at them. There's a cryptomeria right here called limeade. Then we have two groups of tithonia on the back side of the fence. These will eventually get about this tall and that's where the flowers will be, okay? So they're just, we're just getting our first few flowers. So this is one of those, ast uh, it's an aster that is bright, bright orange. And uh, man, I love these, uh, I love these things. They're, again, they're a little smaller than they should be at this point in June, but certainly by mid-July, they'll be this tall and it'll just be solid orange flowers staring back into the garden in that direction. We've got various blueberries along the line, a few uh, giant zinnias that we did from seed. Again, there's five more tithonia in this spot as well. It's gonna be this big and bright orange. So imagine that, <laughs> you know, you'll have to use your imagination for that. There's one additional white wedding hydrangea. This one is further along. It's out here in a little bit more sun than the two in the back garden. But again, you can just see how upright uh, this, this plant is. This one was removed from the back garden. We had three together. We wanted to move a butterfly bush back where this one was. Steph brought it out here, put it in this spot, and we proceeded to forget to water it many, many times. This thing is a true garden survivor. If you think you're a person who kills plants uh, by ignoring them and forgetting to water them, white wedding hydrangea is definitely a plant for you. And I'll finish up, there's a, well actually, there's a variegated sedum here uh, that's interesting and a little ground cover white rose. Uh, but I'll finish up with the uh, Russian sage here out by the road. One of the pollinators absolute favorite. There's a honeybee right here working it right now, but we'll see lots of native bees on this Russian sage as well. So there you go. Uh, it's a lot of plants in this 0.19 acre lot here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And thank you if you've stuck with all of these videos to this point. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, we'll wait a little while before we do any uh, other types of tour videos out here. We'll wait for these annuals to come along and then maybe go through and, uh, and show those off later in the summer. But thank you for following along with the channel.